Do you hear that? That ball bouncing on asphalt, ringing in the emptiness of a small court somewhere near here. One boy, one ball, one dream, one hoop. Shh, listen. Slowly stepping up the foul line, eyeing metal rim whose orange paint has chipped or faded years ago. Eyeing hoop, then ball, then ball, then hoop, then aim, extend, small jump, release. And the ball flows through the air, defying gravity near the rim, and he scores! Take it from the top key, rounds back through his leg, without a glance behind the back, pass to his man on the side. His man runs down the court, takes the ball to the left, uh, takes the ball to the right, uh, sees him out the corner of his eyes, and pass, touching the ball like an ancient relic from Africa. He hears voices of legends before him speaking his name, saying, join us. Join us in the sky like Superman does, like a plane does. One step, two step, up, up, double pump, slam. Hang on the rim, looking down at mere mortals. Here, the rim's orange is shiny and new. Higher than street ballers use, use. Higher than drugs and guns and A's. Higher than all the others. Here, it's all about the ball, the rim, and him. And then, and then, and then, and then, with a little bit of reluctance, he lets go. Of his small circular piece of Olympia, he lets go and falls back to us, the ununderstanding masses, who have never heard of the goat or the booger man except in Sports Illustrated or watched on HBO, so we don't know. We don't know what it feels like to fly with the gods, then walk the streets with demons. So we give them statistics. You know how many make it into the NBA, huh? Do you? Boy, you better join the army or something. Be all you can be but never be what you dream. But whether he's crossing over rivals on the ground and killing naysayers in the air, none of that matters, man. None of that, just the ball, the rim, and him. Shh. Do you hear that? Ball. Bouncing on asphalt. Ringing the emptiness of a small court somewhere near here. One boy, one ball, one dream, one hoop. Shh. Listen as an artist learns his trade. Thank you. So that poem was written by a guy who probably shouldn't have graduated high school, me. <laughs> I've been struggling with dyslexia my whole life. And when I was younger, it was a, a huge barrier. I had a hard time learning how to read, and I would get so frustrated because all the kids in my first grade and second grade class, they all seemed to pick it up really quickly, and, and I just didn't do well with it. And I had an aunt, God bless her, she was a teacher, and she would come to the house every weekend and would work with me on you know, figuring out this dyslexia and learning how to read. And, you know, it was kind of a scarlet letter in my family because everybody else could read, and I just always struggled with it. So my aunt came over, and she really worked with me. But nothing ever seemed to click until one day my uncle came with her, and he brought with him this magical, amazing thing that I don't think I had ever seen before. It was this magic, and it was called a comic book. It blew me away. And the comic book was Captain America 100. It was a comic when they were reintroducing the Captain America of 1942 and the World War II into present-day America. And I was just blown away. I mean, here's a story of this guy that was frozen in ice, and he came back to fight crime. I, I thought... What is this? It was amazing. And so my uncle just kept bringing me comic books, and I kept reading and exploring. And what happened was through those colorful pictures and the words on the page, I began to understand what was going on. And it helped me with my reading comprehension because I kept going back and rereading and rereading. But also, it caught my attention. It got my imagination. I I'm really going to age myself because when I was that age and in school, the only books that we were reading were Dick and Jane. See Dick run, look at Spot jump, Jane does this. And that did not activate my imagination at all. <laughs> so every time when I sat down to read that stuff, I just got bored out of my mind. But Captain America, he was frozen in ice. 
I mean, this was amazing, and that led me to reading bigger things. And by the time I got into middle school, I was reading these big, thick books called the Dragonlance Chronicles. Now, I come from a very conservative background. My father is a Baptist minister, and my mother is even more strict than him. And <laughs> walking in the house with the Dragonlance Chronicles really didn't go over too well. But I was reading, and they were big books, and so my parents kind of looked the other way. And I fell in love with these books, and, and that led me to reading more and more. And I just had this immense appetite to just keep consuming these stories and, and these tales that stretched far beyond anything that I saw in my regular life. And that got me all the way up into high school. But then something else happened in high school. This movie came out. Uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> I thought that was a masterpiece. <laughs> and when I saw it, I thought to myself, this is how I am going to treat school. Because, look, Ferris Bueller had a great time. He, he, he had a beautiful girlfriend, him and his buddy. They had a, a bunch of fun, and, and there were never any consequences. And so in uh, you know, my uh, sophomore year in high school, I just adopted this kind of attitude. I went so far as to figure out a way to make my own report cards. <laughs> and I gave them to my parents, and it flew until the end of the year when the school called and said that I had failed English and I had to go to summer school. This was probably the lowest point of my young life because everybody in my neighborhood was out playing, having a good time. My family went on vacations just to spite me. <laughs> and I had to go to summer school, totally not fun. But there was this teacher, and I cannot remember what her name is, but she, she was an okay teacher, but I, I think she was just bored. And so when we got to the tragedy of Julius Caesar that was in our, our, our textbook, she decided that she was going to have everybody read it and act it out. Now, the tragedy of Julius Caesar had, was in the textbook during the school year, and I never paid any attention to it, didn't even think twice about it. But here at summer school, with having everybody acting it out, Suddenly, it, it, it began to catch me. And, and what I noticed is that everybody struggled reading Shakespeare, everybody. So it didn't matter that I was dyslexic and it took me a while to read out loud because everybody was having the same problems. But also, my dyslexia, it, it seemed to be able to understand Shakespeare. It all made sense. <laughs> and so... As, you know, the kids were stumbling and reading, and they didn't really care about it, you know. But then it was my turn, and she gave me the book, and it was Mark Anthony's speech. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear. I come to bury Caesar, not praise him. The evil that men do live on, and the good often inferred with their bones. And it sunk into my bones. The whole monologue, the part where he talks about the wounds becoming mouths, and I, it just unleashed my imagination. And I started talking to the teacher about it, and she said, well, you know, this is just poetry. And, and, and that took me in another path, and I started reading a lot of poetry. And around this time, hip-hop was a big thing, and, and I realized that hip-hop and poetry is one and the same. And so I got involved in hip-hop, and I made it my goal. What I wanted to be was the Puff Daddy of Orange Park, Florida. <laughs> I had to be that. I was going to work so hard, no one was going to outwork me. And, and, and I did it. I, I, I became the voice of the disenfranchised youth of the suburbs. <laughs> It was great, and, and with that, you know, my parents began to use my love of performing and all of that as a little carrot. And so that carrot led me all the way through graduating high school. I limped to the finish line, but I was happy. I, I, I made it, but I made a conscious decision when I graduated. I said, I'm not going to college. I am so tired of knowing that I'm smarter but not being able to communicate it to people, not being able to let the teachers know. There were a couple teachers that saw it, but on a whole, I felt like, you know, like I was the dumb kid that nobody ever really paid much attention to. And so I decided what I was going to do is I was going to go hang out with all my friends who went to college, and I was going to find out what they read. 
and I would read that, and I would engage in, in, in the things that they were doing in college, but I would do it on my own terms. And so I started checking out these big books from the library, uh, little books, hey, whatever I could get my hands on to read. Around the same time, my love with hip-hop was becoming to an end, uh, coming to an end. Not because I, I, I stopped loving the art form, but because at that period, hip-hop went into this whole gangster rap era. And as much as I loved all those songs and all of those groups, in nobody's vision do I ever fit into being a gangster rapper. <laughs> Just doesn't work. So I, I decided to let it go. And in my quest to learn and expand my horizons, a friend of mine hit me to this series called The Language of Life. It was by Bill Moyers and PBS, plug for public media, why it is so important. Um, and when I listen, you can clap for public media. So as I'm popping in this tape and listening to it, I was introduced to this man, Sekou Sundiata. And when I heard the poetry out of his mouth, it just took me to a completely different place. From whence I come, from whence we come, from whence I come, from whence we come, that dark woman of a land only knows so well. How we tribalize our rest in the West, who can tell? Was once an X, I'll knocked over cross to bear. Like the flatted fifth note of blue, you hear the terrible one we wear like a skin color. I heard that and thought, what is this? Because every bit of poetry that I had ever heard sounded like something from Shakespeare's time. But, but this, this sounded contemporary. This sounded right now. This sounded like me. But it wasn't just hearing his poetry that got me excited. It was his interview. Uh, Mary Baraka had a, um, a poem called With Your Bad Self. I didn't know you could say that in a poem. I mean, we said that all the time in the neighborhood, but this man made literature out of this, you know, and what it did is it really enabled me, sort of opened up a door and said, wait a minute, there's poetry in the language I speak. That right there. There's poetry in the language I speak. And it blew me away. Because what it told me was there was poetry in the dyslexic words that sometimes I had trouble being able to say to people so that they would see the intelligent. There's poetry in the everyday thing that I see around me, in the lives that I see around me. That there's poetry inside of me, there's poetry inside of you, and if we just craft it, we are all poems. We are all living, breathing poems, and, and, and it's beautiful, and it wrapped me up again. And so, just like all the other things that I fell into, I just got deep into it. And I explored and, and, and looked at all the different poets out there, and I stumbled into this thing called slam poetry. And that's when I became familiar with Patricia Smith. Now, Patricia Smith was the reigning poetry champion of the world slam, and, 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 and she was amazing. When I heard her poem for the first time, it completely shifted my world. When a bullet enters the brain, the head explodes. I can think of no softer warning for the young mothers who sit doubled before my desk, nodding their smooth brown hands and begging, fix my boy, fix my boy. Here's his high school picture. What she was doing was telling a story was expanding my horizons through poetry, but also storytelling, and it shaped and crafted me and let me understand that not only could I speak in poetic language, but that my poetic language could say something, that I could reach people and talk about something that was deeper, that I could connect people, that I could help people understand other people's sorrow and pain, but also expose them to the happiness and joy that this world offers. And that's what I decided I would do. So I dove in again, and I started performing all over the country. I was flying everywhere I could go and, and doing these poems and, and performing. And soon enough, like the, the work that I had done got me to a level where high schools were asking me to come perform, a place that I barely graduated from. Colleges were calling me to come and perform and teach workshops, a place, again, that I, I could never even get into because I, I didn't want to go there, but th here I am on stage talking to college kids. 
And it, it's just been an amazing journey. But I never really thought about it until one day I was teaching uh, a, a group of kids at, at a community college. And I, I didn't connect the dots. I didn't realize that every time I've had a hard spot in my life with my dyslexia, it was the art that brought me through. Whether it was Captain America being frozen in a block of ice, or moving to the Dragonlance Chronicles that expanded my world, or, or Shakespeare, or, or, or poetry, or hip-hop, to right now, every step of the way, it was the art that made the path a little bit clearer for me. And it, it didn't really come into focus until I was teaching that class. And in the back of the room, there was this slightly overweight girl, sadness clinging to her eyes, along with the rings from another night of no sleep. She's 16 and just lost her baby because her body wasn't ready to carry to full term. And the first time she talked about it was in a poem she handed to me. Or Carlos, who hates his teachers, hates getting picked on, hates the way he looks in the mirror, and sometimes hates his parents. But instead of picking up a gun, he writes and writes and writes until there's no more ink left in the pen, no more paper to write with, nothing but the written band-aid and the word in his heart. He writes like his life depends on it. But it's mine that he's saving. It's the kids in the correctional facilities at creative writing classes who are opening whole new worlds through the writings of Lorca and Hughes and through their twisted linguistics. They trade the m &Ms, they trade the poetics of Eminem and Jay-Z into a writer's paradise with Lorca and Langston bobbing their head there that I am waiting to achieve. It is writing a poem for my children and knowing that one day they will read it and know that daddy loved them because he wrote with his heart on his sleeve and it's then I know it's then I know as the pen stretches across geographic, economic, and racial barriers, I am reaching for something greater than myself, bigger than the bright lights of the great white way, deeper than a crowd's approval, and more sacred than I have the right to carry. It is then I knew that it's not about me that it's about the kids in the correctional facilities, the grieving mothers of this world, the Carloses, the homeless man on the, strong, on the corner, my kids, and you, and you, and you, and you, and we, and us, saving each other, pushing us forward into, into infinity to save one heartbeat, one person, one soul, one place, one poem at a time. Thank you.